Great. So I guess we'll open it up for questions. How long are we going till burning? Six. Six. Okay. We've got a lot of time for for questions. I guess I'll just uh, call. If I don't, uh, well, uh, Sarah Drew can. And, can I interrupt just a minute? Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, the print said when Ken Cassidy policy is that we always go to student stripes. Oh. So well. <laughs> how? But but Sarah Drew looks so much like a student. He's so youthful looking. And he's a okay. perpetual so that's student. A, that is a good. That is. That is Yes, indeed. That is a very good policy. So are there any uh, apologies? Of course, I don't know everyone's name. It seems that there's someone in the uh, back row there. Do you have to wait? for? I think he'll come with a mic uh, for you. Um, so. Hi, uh, my name's Sanjay. Uh, so I was just wondering what your thoughts were on like the firing of Princeton professor uh, Joshua Katz over the summer. I think it's, I, I think Sergio has written um, brilliantly about it and others have. Um, what I find really, it's unjust, um, unprincipled, um, pretextual excuse was given. I mean, for, and I, I have delved into uh, the facts, including reading the extensive exchange of emails between Sergio and your president. And I actually wrote something about this. Um, Stuart Taylor, who heads the Alumni Free Speech Organization, um, had asked me to opine on it. And what I thought was interesting is in one of those letters from your president, he actually said that um, that 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 he acknowledged that that website that was defaming um, Joshua was an official university communication, and therefore, if it was defamatory, that complaints would be justified. I mean, this is yet another problem in addition to his being um, fired. Um, and then later on, he changed and said, "Well, this is not. This is just the free speech of." Um, the university employees, I guess that gets to one aspect of one of your questions. So, you know, there seem to be constantly shifting rationales, or one could say rationalizations, um, from the perspective of the, of the outside world, um, reflected very poorly on a president who I saw was saluted by the board of trustees or whoever reappointed him. Uh, for support for free speech. Um, I have to say, when, that, when those demands came out um, after the murder of George Floyd, I was appalled at, at some of the demands, you know, the ones that Joshua objected to about having a faculty, and I think it was a faculty and student committee that would be able to review the research of every faculty member. Um, what an appalling intrusion on academic freedom. And yet, it seemed as if everybody here was signing the petition without question. And I remember being so thrilled when I read, I didn't know Joshua Katz then, say the only good thing that's happened as a result of the tragedy of his uh, unjust treatment is I got to meet him. <laughs> I, I, wish, I, I wish that had not happened. I'd rather have been a stranger, wonderful as he is. Um, but I was so thrilled when I read wherever he published that, that he had the courage to do it. Um, and I thought, you know, this is exactly what tenure is for, but it's not enough because we know so many tenured faculty members and you know, I have other friends in academia. John McWhorter is another one who says, you know, faculty members are constantly coming up to him and saying, you know, I really agree that this is a violation of free tenured faculty members, but I don't dare say it publicly. You know, I'll just whisper it privately. What is tenure for if not that? And yet um, Joshua's situation sadly is, is not alone. The fire survey study, very, very detailed report um, uh, showed that from 2015 until 2021, they've updated it, but I haven't, I don't remember the updated statistics. Uh, there were 30 tenured professors who were fired, fired for what should be pre constitutionally protected free speech. And 
don't take my word for it. You can go to FIRE's website. It's an incredibly thorough report uh, for every incident. You can, you know, there's a link and you can go into all of the details. I mean, 30 tenured professors. And um, I'm really sad that it happened to such an outstanding one at what used to be an outstanding university. I'm sorry, I would say, I say that about my alma mater. I really don't think I would go to Harvard today. Um, but uh, on the positive, you know, the fact that you have the Free Speech mm -hmm. Initiative, the Madison Program, the Academic Freedom Alliance, I, in, in another sense, um, you know, and what Joshua did is going to have continuing resonance and significance. Um, so I, in, in another sense, Princeton is a hotbed of, of pushing back and, tr you know, uh, trying to reinvigorate and revitalize. And maybe the net, one of the other contributions will be this updated version of the, of the uh, Calvin principles. But I should ask you, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting issue. Uh, I think there's... <laughs> I think it's an interesting issue. Um, I personally haven't read the emails, so okay. I kind of, I don't have all the information. Yeah, well, it's, it's good of you to say that because um, a lot of people uh, judge first and then information after, if, if at all. So it's good of you to keep an open mind. Yeah. Thank uh, you. But fill it with information. <laughs> Are there any other student uh, questions? Uh, I guess we, well, okay, well, Let's go from here across, uh, just because I recognize Bryce at least, so I can, uh, yeah, Bryce, and then person next to you, and then we have one over here. Hi there. Um, my question is, uh, to what extent do you think so-called uh, cancel culture is simply another expression of free speech? Mm -hmm. And uh, is denunciation and organization against a certain view or the platforming of a certain figure um, just as valid a, a free expression? Yeah, an excellent question, Bryce. And as with so much in constitutional law, it's a delicate balance. If, every, if you absolutely defend free speech rights to criticize in the harshest, uh, most unjust, unfair manner, I defend people's rights to engage in defamation. Um, and I, in fact, not only defend it, but um, the title of my uh, most recent book is Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech. So I am expressly advocating counter speech and robust counter speech with the express goal of suppressing certain ideas, uh, namely hateful ideas. Um, and I first started thinking about this conundrum that you raised um, several years ago when a friend and colleague named Suzanne Nossel, who's the executive director of Pan America, an outstanding free speech organization that works mostly with journalists and, and writers, other writers, uh, she wrote an op-ed that posed the question, when does counter speech go too far? And I thought, hmm, how can counter speech go too far? You know, as um, Mae West once said, uh, too much of a good thing is an even better thing. <laughs> uh, but you know, then of course we started seeing the excesses of so-called counter uh, uh, cancel culture, and so a number of us have tr many people have tried to draw distinctions. But it's a matter of degree, right? Uh, the goal of counter speech is to spur discussion and discourse and to get people to rethink their ideas and to change their mind. And I would say um, the goal and the method of so-called cancel culture is to, you know, not only stop certain people and certain ideas from participating in the discussion at all, but even to stop them from having a career at all. Or, or from being a student at all. So, you know, a really good analogy is to reforms that have been getting great support across the political spectrum in the criminal justice system more generally as people are saying, you know, we've got too harsh 
too punitive an approach. We've got to think more of proportionality. We've got to think more of restorative justice. And you know, if we can take those attitudes toward and 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 use them against people even who are convicted of homicide, can't we do it for people who have ideas um, that are troublesome or expressions that are insensitive or offensive? Uh, and among other reasons, in terms of what's going to work, I don't think you, you know, treating somebody as a criminal is going to get them to change their attitudes. It's going to have the opposite impact, and often it makes them appear to be martyrs, so they become more sympathetic and garner more followers. Um, I've read many, many powerful accounts of even former leaders of hate monger, white supremacist organizations who have been, and this is the term they use, who have been redeemed, not because they were thrown in prison, not because they were shamed and shunned and ostracized and demonized, but because of a patient, incredibly patient interaction with people who uh, treat them with respect, uh, empathy, compassion, not for their ideas, but for them as human beings who engage in these really patient dialogues. And you can read accounts. A number of these former um, white supremacist leaders have written you know, very powerful memoirs in which they talk about how they ultimately redeem themselves through engaging in this kind of conversation. So I, I oppose cancellation uh, for two reasons. Number one, it, 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 it goes too far in silencing debate about important ideas. And number two, it's not an effective way to uh, overcome hateful and other really negative ideas. Speaking of troublesome ideas, I think that's the first time Mae West was ever mentioned at a James Madison <laughs> event. So I'm not sure. Um, everyone would approve. Um, yeah, the student right next to Bryce. Um, yeah. Uh, or, well, we can take both of you. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, how much time do we have? We've got time for lots of questions. Whichever one of you wants to go first. I'm very. I find keeping a cue incredibly stressful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jaden. I'm a first year and I'm studying politics. I had a two part question for you sort of relating to um, a lot of the issues that you just described. So the first, um, you just recently just said that um, you think that, um, you know, like the tenure system as it stands right now sort of needs to be reformed in order to protect free speech. How do you suggest we do that? And then the second is, do you think that, um, I guess, like existing plans for regulation of like online companies like social media, like um, like abolishing Section 230 um, would like result in better protections of free speech, or maybe what do you propose in order to like maintain those values online better? Thank you, Jaden. So uh, for the first part, I'm sorry that I didn't communicate clearly. I don't think that the tenure system should be reformed. I just think that um, t people who have this incredible privilege and job security are not taking advantage of it for the uh, purpose for which it was instituted, namely to protect academic freedom. I guess, you know, maybe your question comes from the fact that I said tenure wasn't an adequate protection for the 30 professors who got fired notwithstanding tenure, which I guess is to say that, you know, the, 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 if you look at the details, for example, the Joshua Katz situation here, there's always a loophole that can be invoked if there's enough persistence and determination to get rid of somebody. And, and in fact, uh, even without revoking somebody's tenure, you can make their life miserable by, you know, not giving them raises, not letting them teach what they want to teach and so forth. So it's, it's necessary but not sufficient to protect academic freedom. Uh, on the second point, um, I very strongly support Section 230. As most of you know, um, that is a statute that Congress passed when the internet was new to encourage companies to maximize a third party's use of their platforms. Uh, because there was a negative court ruling uh, using old, you know, many people think it was incorrect even under the law that existed at the time, uh, that the judge held a uh, platform liable for a defamatory statement 
that was posted by a user. And with that kind of liability, you can understand that these platforms would have to become the same kind of strict gatekeeper that the traditional broadcast media are, and that would completely obliterate the unique promise of the internet of giving voice to all the rest of us who could not get onto you know, broadcast network TV. And as the Supreme Court said when it upheld the First Amendment rights of uh, the internet companies, that this is the most mass participatory medium uh, that the world has ever seen. But it would have been shrunk to the level of broadcast TV without Section 230. That said, there are a lot of really difficult issues. Uh, I think that these companies are, um, I do support their free speech rights, First Amendment rights as communications platforms. On the other hand, I'm very troubled that they're exercising that power to uh, arbitrarily at best and uh, discriminatorily at worst suppress certain speakers and certain ideas. There's no recourse under the First Amendment. And scholars across the ideological spectrum, whom I deeply respect, are advocating that the companies should have some common carrier responsibilities um, to serve as neutral conduits, uh, just the way the landline phone companies did and the telegraph companies and carriers like FedEx and so forth. So uh, that's actually all being litigated right now, very complicated from a First Amendment perspective. Okay, we have a couple more student questions and then I, I am aware of uh, those more senior um, <laughs> attendees who would also like to get into the queue. Yeah, uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. We'll go here at, and then. Well, you're you're for uh, you're, you're sitting right Consistent there, Consistent with the it's left very hard. I, yeah, it's hard. I need to go. We've taken a lot of questions from the left. Okay. Uh, yeah, but she's she's right in front of you. I want to go here, and then we'll take it over uh, to the side, and then open it up generally. Hi, I'm Abby. Also a first year, probably majoring in history. We'll see. When do you have to decide your majors? Uh, sophomore year some time. Um, so I have like two questions, so I'm just gonna ask both and then you can pick which one. Um, but so my first question is you mentioned that um, there were some cases of these these white supremacists that when engaging in dialogue it really helped them like change their perspective and their narrative. How do we respond when there are people that genuinely just aren't interested in engaging in that dialogue and just want to spew their hateful rhetoric? Like until what point can we allow that to happen while it's causing more and more, more harm and like there are people trying to rebut the speech but it's not it's not rebutting because they're just not interested mm -hmm. so so how do you respond to that and my second question is I guess along the same lines like if speech is genuinely harmful you know the question of of like screaming fire in a crowded room like until what point can we protect or can we um, encourage speech under this this clause of, of free speech. Okay, well, thank you very much, Abby. I think I can answer both of your questions. But um, starting with the, the second one, um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to point out that along with 99.99% .99 of people who uh, quote that statement, you misquoted it. You're a very good company. I was once on a panel with uh, Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, and he said, said it the same way you did. <laughs> if the theater is on fire, you want people to shout fire, right? So you may not falsely shout fire, in a theater. And that's not just a cute point. That really gets to the essence of the principle, which is if when the speech is life saving, you know, the theater is on fire and you're shouting fire, then you're protecting it. But if and only if the speech directly and imminently threatens serious harm, such as the situation where it's a false statement and you cause a stampede and people uh, are threatened to stampede and people get injured, uh, then the speech may be punished. So that ties back to your first question. Uh, when people are spewing hate, um, they may definitely do some harm. Some people may be persuaded 
uh, by the speech and may join a white supremacist organization, may engage in discriminatory or violent conduct. And that used to be the standard that we had in this country for punishing speech until the civil rights movement. And it's no coincidence that the Supreme Court changed the First mm -hmm. Amendment law then. Um, but it used to be the so-called bad tendency test when speech might indirectly potentially lead to some harm, then it could be punished. And in that context, Oliver Wendell Holmes in a dissent said, every idea is an incitement, right? There's literally nothing that could not possibly satisfy that bad tendency standard, including everything that I'm saying here, you know, may encourage them. Hey, hey, she tells me I have free speech. I'll go out and I'll spew this hatred. Um, and, and so um, the danger of giving the government, so yes, the speech is definitely potentially harmful, but giving the government that much latitude to punish speech because of potential harm basically is giving the government carte blanche to pick and choose what ideas it dislikes. And that's why you look at the march of US history and who was censored. You can go through basically every social justice movement from abolitionism. You know, my favorite statement, I think if I had to pick one uh, in favor of free speech and its instrumental power, put aside its you know uh, power in terms of individual self-expression, uh, Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, himself born uh, as an enslaved person, um, said, slavery cannot abide free speech. Five years of its exercise would break, would, would banish every auction block and break every chain in the South. Five years of its exercise. So, but so abolition was though they were suppressed. You know, and abolitionist magazines were suppressed. You know, suffragists were uh, their speech was suppressed. Um, those who opposed World War One, conscientious objectors, labor union organizers, and basically by the time we got to the civil rights movement, and you know, I already mentioned Martin Luther King writing his letter from Birmingham jail. It's no coincidence that the Supreme Court at the time, which was very supportive of the civil rights movement, also um, in the context of those cases, uh, abandoned the bad tendency test and moved in the direction of what now we generally call the emergency test, when speech directly and imminently threatens or causes certain serious specific harm, then it can be punished. And there's a lot of hateful speech Sadly, that satisfies that standard, you know, um, and some of these subcategories that the Supreme Court has recognized will sound familiar to you. Um, if the hateful speaker is intentionally inciting imminent violent or lawless conduct, that's likely to happen imminently, that can be punished. Uh, if there's a true threat, you know, the speaker is targeting a specific person or a small group of persons and intends to instill a um, a reasonable fear that they're going to be subject to attack. Uh, but what cannot be punished is solely disagreement with the hateful idea. There we have to answer with, uh, with free speech. Or to get to another part of your first question, um, one strategy is to ignore them. Sometimes they are just seeking attention. And the most, it, it's very tempting, and you can feel morally very you know, satisfied if you're trying to engage in the debate. Uh, but if you are thinking strategically about how to draw the oxygen away from them, ignore them, turn your back on them. You know, they're often looking for the publicity that inevitably comes with attempts to silence them. Great, uh, over here. Hi, my name is Danielle. I'm a sophomore. And I'm sorry, I didn't hear your name. My name is Danielle. I'm Danielle, a sophomore. Hi. And I was wondering, you mentioned a lot of important recent cases and events that have occurred. So I'm wondering, this might be a challenge, but in the past three years, let's say, um, what would you count to be the the least, what would make you, what case or event would make you the least optimistic in regards to free speech and academic freedom? And what case or event would make you most optimistic? Wow. Um, I would say, let me start, 
you know, I'm an activist and as an activist, I'm a congenital optimist. So I'm of course gonna start with the, uh, what makes me the most encouraged. And I would say it's events like this and how I spent the morning with even younger students um, there are so many, and I'm constantly meeting students all over the country, and in fact, all over the world, uh, because these issues are definitely worldwide in nature. Um, and there is so much fervor for free speech, and in some ways galvanized by the understandably perceived attacks on free speech make people realize that they can't take it for granted. And so people are turning out and showing up and standing up and speaking up. And you know, in that cluster of you know, this audience, um, I, I, I already saluted, I think, if not, I apologize, the Academic Freedom Alliance, which uh, Keith was so instrumental in founding, um, and the expanded mandate of FIRE, the growth of Heterodox Academy, um, University of Austin, there's just this whole panoply of institutions that have sprung up. Yes, it's too bad that they feel the need to be formed to counter the challenges to free speech, but it's really thrilling that they are forming and they are gathering support all over the country. So that's kind of cheating because it's, it's a pattern rather than a single event. Um, in terms of what makes me the most um, uh, the, the least hopeful, uh, I guess I would say it's the co-opting by the right of uh, rhetoric that came from the left about being uncomfortable mm -hmm. and you know divisive concepts, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which just shows that he, you have to be so. So I'm taking a pro free speech lesson from it. So we started hearing all this rhetoric from students and faculty, mostly on the left, that they had to be protected from ideas that make them uncomfortable or speak that are divisive. And while the right is 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 complaining about that, at the first opportunity, they appropriate this exact same rhetoric and then implement it through legislation mm -hmm. that um, Greg alluded to, that now it's written in statutes in so many states that schools may not teach in any way or assign any materials or bring in any speakers that make students feel uncomfortable or that are divisive. And so you know, the downside of that is that um, I feel that too many people are too short-sighted, that they'll use even strategies that they condemned one minute ago mm. to support uh, a more narrow partisan agenda and, and lose sight of the larger principles. But since you ask in a three-year framework, I'm really curious, Danielle, did you have particular incidents in mind? <laughs> Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do you mind sharing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're asking a funny person because personally, um, I've dealt with a few bureaucratic things. I've seen the dark sides of Princeton, I should say, yeah. as well. Um, but I would agree with your optimism, and I'm lucky to be able to be at Princeton, especially compared to a lot of other similar schools. I think Princeton does it does a pretty good job of creating institutions for students, but I would definitely say it's not all optimistic, unfortunately. Great, were there any other student questions? Um, Abigail and then a couple of, if, if, you, if you weren't a student, you, you may not get in, and that was not my, not my fault, let me say. So your tuition dollars are really, you know, coming, you're getting your money's worth. All right. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, Tennessee passed a bill allowing teachers to refrain from using a student's preferred pronouns. In other words, the law allows teachers to misgender students. The ACLU condemned this legislation, saying, quote, this bill raises serious statutory and constitutional concerns by singling out trans students for worse treatment than their peers, end quote. Is the ACLU still a pro-free speech organization if it wants to require teachers to use preferred pronouns? 
Well, I have to say I have not followed that particular situation, and um, so I'm not going to comment on the facts, Abigail, but let me say this, that in terms of free speech, the ACLU puts it into practice. We debate each other all the time, and on many issues there is a split among the leadership. Um, I was a dissenter even when I was president of the ACLU on hmm. particular issues. And I think the ones where you see differences are when there is more than one civil liberty involved. But I remember very big debates um, shortly after I became president over a, a similar issue when we were first dealing with um, serious attempts to address and redress sexual harassment the question you know in harassment when you're not when you're talking about a so-called hostile environment harassment can consist of ideas and expression and i can't tell you how many hours of debate we had in trying to craft a policy that was you know sufficiently protecting the equal rights of women and, and others um, uh, but without unduly infringing on freedom of speech, and I suspect that those same debates are, are going forward. I have absolutely no doubt that the national leadership of the ACLU, including the na and national executive director, Anthony Romero, who's a graduate of Princeton, um, and uh, the national executive and uh, national legal director David Cole are absolutely supportive of free speech, very robustly. I would recommend uh, David writes very frequently for the New York Review, and he's written very. He's taken a lot of heat, including from people within the organization who, who disagree with his perspectives, because he defended the. We represented the Unite the Right demonstrators, their free speech rights in Charlottesville. You can imagine there has been a huge amount of pushback against that. Uh, and David wrote, I thought, very uh, compellingly about it. When he is, uh, has been a law professor at Georgetown, I think he's kind of on leave while he's legal director of the ACLU. So when uh, there was the incident last year with Ilya Shapiro, uh, who had been hired to run some constitutional center at Georgetown Law School, but had an inartfully worded tweet about uh, Biden's pledge to appoint a black woman to the Supreme Court. Uh, basically, he got uh, Ilya got suspended, and you know then in that the investigation went forward. David wrote a very brave piece um, criticizing the dean for doing that. And and here's another example: no te other tenured professors at Georgetown Law School spoke up against this clear violation of academic freedom. Um, so I, I, but I'm sure there, I know there are debates within the organization. And one thing that I've seen not only in the ACLU, but in journalism, in academia, um, in theater, in uh, arts and culture organizations among librarians, um, human rights organizations, all these institutions that traditionally have had a commitment to free speech, there's a real pushback from the youngest cohorts. You know, they're doing what John Stuart Mill would, uh, you know, urge them to do: rethink everything, question everything, challenge everything. But there's, you know, there there are tensions within these organizations, and the ACLU has uh, a federalist structure, so. Um, every state has a, a, an autonomous affiliate, mm -hmm. and the affiliates can disagree with each other and can disagree with the national. We actually, in one important free speech issue about 20 years ago, we were in the Supreme Court with the national ACLU on one side and an ACLU affiliate on the other side. And I'm not embarrassed about that because I think, you know, when as long as there are good faith civil liberties arguments, why should you be ashamed that you can reach different accommodations? Oh, I guess it, <laughs> Siri or whatever does not agree that this is something where, well, I don't know who that Don't think that came from any of the, yeah, anyway, whoever's in charge of that thing should, uh, should, should turn it off. Sorry, were you, you were. Well, I think so, that's pretty much the okay. end, but thank you for raising that. So we have a few more questions over here. From, so maybe we'll take two at a time now and uh, okay. try in order to try to field a few more. So there, uh, I don't know your names, I'm sorry, but you, you had your hand up there in the. 
Uh, how do you, maybe stand so that he can see where you are, yeah. Uh, and then behind you, uh, yeah, and to the right there. So, you, okay. yeah, I, I can go first. Um, so, hello, my name is Daniel. I am a second year, probably politics. So just wanted to ask about what might be called the gap between the formal regime governing free speech in college campuses and the informal regime governing free speech in college campuses. Mm. Uh, that is to say, a lot of most universities have very strong formal protections for freedom of expression, but the cultural norms surrounding its usage, especially among college students and including some faculty, are not nearly as strongly enforced. Um, so what, is, what are your thoughts on that? Is there anything that could or should be done to bridge that gap? <laughs> I, yeah. I couldn't agree with you more, Daniel. I, I hear it all the time, including from the vaunted University of Chicago. I have a very good friend who's an undergraduate there. Um, and we became friends because of her commitment to free speech. And she shares that with her, her cohort. But, uh, and even knowing that the university is not going to punish them uh, for anything they say, they are so concerned about mm. peer pressure that she said, um, none of us says anything without asking ourselves, and in class or out of class, without asking ourselves this question, is it worth it? Mm. And I think, you know what? It's so sad, but it's so rational. And I'm a, I do that myself. There are a lot of things that I don't say, which I really wish I could, but I do a cost-benefit analysis. I think that's gonna to be too much of a distraction from my overall mission. Now, to some extent, that is effective communication. But when it reaches into not voicing an idea or even a question, or even not talking about whole topics, this was a question that I asked the younger students that I was with today, because I've heard some strains of you know, the optimist in me hoping that this is true, that the younger generation, you know, like everyone is rebelling against the one that came before. So they've heard so much about cancel culture that they're hopefully, you know, going to crusade against it. But, you know, I, in their candor, they made it pretty clear that they're very hesitant to uh, talk about many subjects. And they actually said that their teachers, uh, they, they observed that their teachers won't address mm. certain subjects. And I said, well, how can you tell? Well, they say, well, the teacher says, uh, I'm not going to say any more about this because I, I want to avoid, you know, saying something offensive or saying something insensitive. And I'm going to—I have to throw the question right back at you, Daniel, because exactly as you say, this isn't something that can come from the top down. Yes, leadership is really important, but not leadership in the sense of enunciating principles. It has to be leadership that models the appropriate form of behavior and interaction. But it also has to come from the ground up. And I think we just really need more and more students to do, uh, you know, to participate in the free speech initiative. And uh, many students are forming um, uh, safe spaces for dialogue, you know, bridge organizations, and they have other names, free speech initiatives, where they come together and they, you know, uh, people with different views and pledge that they're going to respectfully disagree and not engage in viral campaigns. But who knows how secure somebody can really be in, in accepting that pledge. I asked them the question that one of the written questions you had mm -hmm. asked me, Greg, about the non-attribution policy. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they all laughed at it. They said none of us would believe that a a anybody would honor it. Well, you'd have to actually punish people who didn't honor it. Yeah. That's, um, and, yeah. But yeah. And, She's and, talking about here the idea, well, just if I, yeah. that her alma mater, Harvard Law School, actually did for a while, I don't know if it's still in effect, prohibit um, prohibit their students from mentioning other students by name outside the university, right? So for things that they said, it, on the grounds that the thing that actually impedes students from speaking freely is not so much that they think the professor will give them a bad grade, but that someone will contact a potential future employer or will immediately go on social media and say, person X, Y, Z said this horrible thing. And they put it into, into practice. I don't know if it worked. I think it's interesting that they did that. And they did it during the pandemic when everything was going to be online. I think they thought that, uh, I don't know, maybe that uh, primed students immediately to log out from Zoom and go on social media and say something against the, uh, their, their peers. But I think it's worth exploring something like that. But in order for it to have any teeth, you would actually have to punish a student who then did try to harm the life prospects of one of their peers 
by talking about something they said in the classroom, for example. The Heterodox so, Academy just put out a report, which I was again reading this morning in preparation for this, um, which is a best practices that can be instituted in universities in, in every single aspect, including starting in the recruitment process and the orientation process and all the extracurricular, mm -hmm. you know, to really, really, really make it clear in every possible way and facilitate, you know, genuine free speech. But, you know, we, we can't do it alone. We need your help as well. And I think just by being there and participating is, is a very important step. But if you have any suggestions, you know, what we can do as faculty members and administrators, please, we're, we're hungry for ideas. Can I plug something? Yes, please. Uh, yes, all of you should come to Wig Bio Center today because we do a very strict non-attribution policy. So if you take hmm. pictures, Interesting. videos, talk about other students, you will not be allowed to show. Shoot pictures as well. I don't know if that's enough of a... No, that, that's very interesting. Yes. I didn't know that Wig Clio did that. Yes, that's so it. we, we hmm. hold, uh, we have speakers on this side, and we also have work meetings. Mm -hmm. So anybody that's in the audience can come and speak for three to two minutes. We have a very lively discussion, possibly one train. Is this like the Yale Political Union? Yeah, this is the debating society, but right. something to which I've never been invited. Though I have, <laughs> I, I don't, you know, I don't know what that what that says. No, I'm just just teasing you, just teasing you. Uh, can you pass the microphone to the? Oh, he's he's got it. Yeah, already. I got it here. Hi, my name's Wade. First of all, thank you so much for coming here is to speak to us. Wade? Oh, hi. Uh, I wanted to go back to the question of academic freedom mm -hmm. in public schools specifically mm -hmm. and critical race theory. Mm -hmm. So some people would argue that academic freedom doesn't really exist in public schools because public education is by definition government regulated yeah. and standardized. Yeah. For example, we require chemistry and algebra in public schools, but not alchemy or witchcraft mm -hmm. uh, because those ideas are discredited and that would be pretty counterproductive. My question is, how do we exactly decide that an idea should or should not be taught in public schools? Or should we just have this sort of completely free million con conception of uh, the market of ideas in public schools. Um, and I don't think Mill would disagree with uh, the line that is drawn, uh, both by actual practice in schools and by the one Supreme Court decision on point, um, I'm proud to say another ACLU case in 1982, that it all, so all of us who engage in the academic enterprise, including at the university level, are constantly making content-based decisions, right? Mm -hmm. Not every course can be offered in the, uh, in mm -hmm. the curriculum. Not every, every book can be taught on the syllabus. Um, not every faculty member, potential faculty member with every idea can be hired. Not every research project can be funded. Not every speaker can be invited. You have to go through a selection process, but the criteria have to be in terms of educational suitability mm. and relevance, right? Um, and mm. it standards according to the you know, we can judge the next book that is being written by Greg uh, according to the standards of his academic discipline, mm. right? And it's going to be brilliant, of course, um, by those Naturally. standards, but we're, we're judging it, right? Mm. Um, what is an impermissible criterion is if an idea is excluded or a book is excluded or a faculty member is denied tenure solely because of disagreement with the viewpoint. And so the one decision that the Supreme Court had about, uh, it wasn't about curricular matters, but about books in public school library, it said, you know, if the, and there it was a removal decision, if books are removed because they are deemed to be age inappropriate or educationally unsuitable or they've become outdated, uh, in terms of their coverage, that's a completely appropriate reason. But if they are withdrawn only because of political pressure, because the community rejects the ideas or considers the authors to be unpopular people, that is not a legitimate reason. 
I think there was one student. Was there a student hand? Uh, yeah, and then I think we might have, so I've had to pass over many extremely esteemed people, but as they say once in Seinfeld, the bodega owner, even I am not above the policy. So <laughs> we've had all of the, uh, the students, and I, I think we'll uh, allow the last word here. And obviously, you for you to respond. Yeah, it's uh, right there. Um, yeah, stand up if you can't see you. Hi, my name is Tori, um, and I'm also in the politics department. And my question is just that free speech has been seen as kind of like this partisan issue as of late, um, especially like conservative issue, which I think is probably why some people in groups are naturally against it. And so I'm kind of just wondering, what, what do you think we can do to kind of like change that narrative? How can we get people on both sides, the political spectrum, to value free speech as you've talked about it? Thank you so much. And did you say your name is Tori or Corey? Tori. Tori. Um, wow, political name. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Tori, that was the tablet article that I mentioned mm. um, early on because I really did uh, and in fact, that was really why I wrote my book, quite frankly, because I saw that conservatives and libertarians were in general being supportive of free speech for hate speech. Uh, and so the audience I was trying to pitch were my fellow travelers politically, namely political liberals. And in both the book and the article, I, I think the compelling way to make the argument is to demonstrate why the ideas and the speakers that you support uh, really depend on this robust concept of free speech. And sadly, you know, given the real breadth of the ACLU's work, uh, going back to, to Abigail's question, uh, I can find so many examples for every instance mm -hmm. of you know, right-wing uh, white supremacy speech um, that is invoking a certain, you know, principle to protect, I can give an example of exactly the opposite perspective. So let me eliminate the double negatives and say, you know, going back to the Skokie case, um, there we had a group of neo-Nazis who was demonstrating in a heavily Jewish neighborhood that included many Holocaust survivors, we pointed out in our brief that the very arguments that they were making, you know, that this is dangerous, that it's subversive, that it's completely inconsistent with our values, <coughs> we had made those very same arguments 10 years before in another city in Illinois that had very different politics namely Cicero, Illinois, which is in the southern part of the state. Uh, and we were defending Martin Luther King's right to march. And the people in Cicero made exactly the same arguments. It's subversive, it's dangerous, it's inconsistent with our values. Okay. Today, you know, when people are trying to call for censorship of um, disinformation or hate speech or extremist speech, Every single one of those epithets and potential rationales for censorship has been used against Black Lives Matter. Uh, we have powerful politicians who have said that Black Lives Matter advocacy is hate speech, hate speech against white people, hate speech against police officers. We've had powerful politicians say that Black Lives Matter advocacy is disinformation. And the tablet article, I quoted a couple mm -hmm. of them who say, you know, they pretend to be in favor of racial justice, but they're really advocating Marxism. It's just a big lie. You know, and then they've also been called extremists and terrorists. Um, and in fact, in terms of um, intentional incitement, there are a lot of people who are hoping that Donald Trump can, and others, Ted Cruz perhaps can be held, Rudy Giuliani, can be held under that standard for speeches that they gave on January 6th. I'm agnostic because it's a very fact-specific uh, uh, consideration, but I would insist that the strong speech protective standards be adhered to because you water them down and it's going to affect another client that we had in the Supreme Court last year D. Ray McKesson, who is a major leader of Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. and he was actually held, and there was an attempt to hold the whole movement liable in huge punitive damages 
because he was giving a speech about police violence and um, it was in a, a police killing of a, a black man in Louisiana. And there was a rally and he was using, you know, strong rhetoric, condemning police abuse. And in that event, somebody threw what was described as a rock-like object and injured a police officer. Obviously, whoever did that would be culpable. They've never been able to find the perpetrator. But the police officer, the injured police officer, brought a lawsuit against BLM and against D. Ray McKesson saying that was intentional incitement, you know, his rabble-rousing speech against police uh, brutality. And Fortunately, with the Supreme Court didn't completely decide the case, they made kind of a preliminary ruling, but it was to in, in, insist on, no, it has to be intentional incitement of imminent violence that the speaker intended and was likely. Uh, and I, I made that point to this Wall Street Journal uh, interviewer who, mm. uh, he then paraphrased me. So you're saying what's good for Donald Trump is good for BLM and vice versa. So I think what you have to do is kind of give examples that what is at stake is an underlying principle. Yes, in one case, it may redound to the benefit of somebody whose ideas you abhor, but the very same principle is needed. And it's not needed just historically, it's needed right now to protect an idea that you cherish. Great, well, so I think we've uh, run, out of, run out of time. Uh, I'd say one thing that makes me optimistic are all the good questions from students, so not all is dead at, at Princeton. And let's thank our uh, esteemed guests. Oh, well, thank you all. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was really a pleasure. <laughs>